The Olden World Written by Tsar Yoshi Chapter 376 Places to Avoid well, well, someone certainly enjoyed this meal's preparation, Jarder remarked in congratulation, closing his eyes and holding a spoon to his beak. Sweet orange curry, thin enough to work perfectly over rice, hot enough to tickle the taste buds, and with enough chunky texture to retain character and flair. I definitely won't mind eating like this for the rest of our travels, if you're inclined to continue chefing so. Sweet, huh? Valet poked at hers, lapping it up experimentally. Mm, not bad. Might add some sugar to mine, though. Hey, arm flanks! What's in this? You haven't had this before, Jam Jones muttered, having descended from her lair in one of the unclaimed cabins. My mother only made things she liked. It's... Interesting, she decided, chewing slowly. I see someone got creative in my storeroom, Shinesburg announced, wiping her lips with a telekinetic napkin and then folding her forelegs behind her. Can't use that stuff to save my life, but it looks like I ran into someone who can. Good job, Maple. This isn't half bad. What is it? Starlight asked, slowly licking hers. As I said, a sweet orange curry over rice bearing hints of... Maple's ears folded from the praise as Gerardo launched into a, a very repetitive explanation of the food's finer qualities, moving into the cultural origin of the ingredients and then a story that reminded him of him doing battle in Barcidal. The only passenger not at the table was Slipstream, as she had volunteered to hold the course so Shinespark could take a break and join the meal. Valet dipped up her bowl, shoveled part of its contents down her gullet, set it back, and belched. So, Birdo, she began, fuzzy chin and cheek stained orange, and a grain of rice stuck to her nose. Riff and Vinny has a big place, right? Where exactly in it are we going? Ah, a fine question. Gerardo snapped his talons and settled for drumming them on the table as he spoke. That will ultimately be up to our captain to decide. However, there are a few likely candidates. The closest possible destination, where we to travel perfectly and immediately east from the mouth of the Yules, is Stormhoof Fortress, a heavily armored and fortified castle city upon the coastline. It is a bright and prosperous trading post that... In times of heavier naval traffic, was known as the closest port to Andridge. It is also home to a military garrison and navy whose primary task is to protect the waterways and keep them clear of pirates, freebooters, and brigands, though it also is owned by one of the most influential political families and has quite a few ceremonial duties. He took another bite, mulling ideas over. Were we feeling in no hurry, we could press inland and make for the capital instead. That would be even more grand, though we do possess a sizable enough fortune thanks to our friend Kiro to make our way in such a city, if you felt like touring the impressive and awe-inspiring. That said, I would completely understand if any of you were burnt out on seeing the best and busiest after Einridge. In such a case, we would adjust our course north and visit any of the other coastal or landlocked territories. Much of the Empire's wealth is concentrated in city enclaves built around the manners of local lords, so practically anywhere in the countryside we would be guaranteed nothing but farmland, peace, and quiet. We could always visit the town of a lesser lord in a bid to maintain civilization while avoiding grandeur and trouble, though I'd have to take some time in the larger cities first myself to retune my understanding of who the fair and just ones are. And we can't go too far north, for we risk running off the edge of the map into uncivilized territories, and I'm supremely sure none of those here want to pursue that. Uncivilized territories? Maple tipped her head in curiosity. What do those look like? Also a fair question, and I've been to them on occasion myself. Gerardo swallowed, setting down his bowl, and took a long drink from his glass. You're familiar with the general geography of the Empire, yes? Maple? Shook her head. Well, it works like so. Gerardo mimed a big circle in the air with his talons, pointing to several places within. The Empire is essentially a single valley of truly massive scale, he narrated, hemmed in by the seven mountains to the south, the sea to the west, and should you dare to journey far enough north, the misty mountains. While they are actually more of hills than mountains, especially next to the Kyrgyzstan, an ancient and unknown magic pervades the area, 
perpetually shrouding it in rolling waves of fog. Thick, thin patches in between, it affects the sky as well, making it appear on the edge of dusk, no matter how near to noon or how cloudless the sky. Even the goddess Garshiva's power is not enough to dispel the area, and while everyone, including her, insists it is part of the Empire, those lands are not a place most folks go. Valet burped again, finally wiping a hoof across her muzzle. So, just fine to me. What's better to make them scary? A dragon or something? Gerardo winked. They are the Bat Pony Lands, or, as they are known within the Empire, Cerosians. Oh, really now? Belay pursed her lips in keen interest. Indeed, uneasily, Gerardo nodded and continued. Of note, the clan as an official stance refuses to worship Garshiva as a goddess and instead exalts another figure. The Night Mother, they call her, and other related titles. However, this figure refuses to come forth and present herself, despite Garshiva existing in the public eye. A lot of griffins and ponies feel somewhat irked by this, that the Cerosians remain obstinate in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. A lot of Cerosians feel likewise, since even those who come south in the mountains and acknowledge Garshiva in addition to the matron are met with unscrupulous gazes and negative- Are you serious?! Valet shot up, the smirk completely gone from her face. The entire Griffin Empire has a thing against bad ponies, and you wait to tell me this until I get my hopes up that my life will somehow be different from Ironwich? She sagged slowly back into her chair, then thunked her head against the tabletop, causing her bowl to rattle dangerously. I hate this, she whimpered, suddenly defeated. Maple's hooves carried her awkwardly to Valet's side, ears folded and unsure of what to do. Gently, she patted the bad pony's shoulders with a hoof, looking uncertainly at Gerardo, who gazed apologetically back. He could have mentioned it earlier, but at least he was giving them ample warning to prepare or turn back. Do we want to change our plan? Maple murmured. Turn around and go somewhere else? We could still... No, the leg groaned, getting her forehoof beneath her and shaking her limp head. No, don't mind me. The other place is still worse. Just don't. I'll manage like I always have. Still better than being alone. I always wonder if it was just me or if I had something against bad ponies in general. If it helps, Jardo hesitantly began, relations between the regions do consistently stay quite stable, and a few dirty looks are likely the worst you'll see. I've heard no rumblings whatsoever during my travels that any widespread conflict could begin. No, it was Maple's turn to look uneasy. There was what Ambi said sending us to Ironridge, too. I'm aware, Gerardo frankly nodded. But in this case, there is a very hefty stabilizing agent in play. Garshiva herself consistently pardons the entire Cerusian race of any and all crimes of heresy, refuses to allow developmental or military advancements or excursions of the terrain by those willing to brave the unnatural climate, demands citizenship for them regardless, and even mandates that they be allowed to place statues of the goddess around the southern side of the empire that they used to pray to, and makes defacing or stealing those statues a heretical offense. In short, it is impossible to declare holy war in the name of Garshiva without also denouncing her and incurring her wrath, and the Cerosians to the north are generally content to be left alone. Any trouble that could occur would be limited to you and you alone, likely due to stupid and unprepared opponents, and I hear you're exceptionally difficult to get the jump on. <laughs> yeah, the lay wiped her eyes. Well, at least get some good meat bagging in if I get jumped by fags who have no idea what they're messing with. Still stinks, but oh well. I'll manage. Maple touched her shoulder again, offering a supportive smile. One thing that doesn't make sense, though. Valet fixed Gerardo with a look. This night mother is the mare in the moon, right? Gerardo blinked. I can't say I've heard that connection myself. Valet snorted. If it's the same thing who my local lore says created bad ponies, what are these chumps getting themselves in hot water for when she never even cared in the first place? 
my village sure didn't have anything to say about her that was worth being persecuted for. It makes you look all edgy and spooky and untrustworthy and stuff. And she's a monster who lives in the moon and doesn't even bother to keep a company here in the world. She shook her head. But that's always sounded kind of ridiculous, to be honest. Never believed it myself. So maybe the Sorosians have the real version and she's not as much of a jerk as I've heard? Might be kind of nice. Uh, Gerardo hopelessly shrugged. All I'm aware of is that at night, they claim their special statues allow them to hear her voice and receive guidance and encouragement. However, as far as anyone else is aware, they are inert hunks of rock. Who can say? Meh. Valet folded her limbs again. I don't even care anymore. More curry? Might as well try to draw my sorrows and food and sugar. End of chapter 370.